Hello and welcome to Behind the Charts. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com. We sat down not too long ago in Atlanta with Fred Meisner. Fred is the editor of the Fred Report, which focuses on technical analysis for asset allocation, particularly for financial advisors. Fred has had a successful career as a sell-side technical analyst uh, at Merrill Lynch and other, uh, other research shops, so he learned from some of the best. I love talking with Fred about how he got started, and you'll hear the, his stories about how he proactively reached out to people like Larry Williams and Jeff Weiss and just made a connection with them that turned into, uh, into very good things. So it was a great lesson for uh, those of you earlier in your career about how to make an impact with those that have, uh, that have paved the way ahead of you. Fred's approach is pretty classic, and it focuses on using the charts to understand asset allocation, putting, him, uh, putting himself into the mind of an advisor, and thinking about how the charts can help them better allocate. So here's my conversation with Fred Meisner, editor of The Fred Report. Hey, everyone. We're here on location in Atlanta, Georgia, meeting with Fred Meisner. Fred is a uh, longtime uh, friend, actually, through the Market Technicians Association, a former president, and is the editor and founder of The Fred Report. Good to be with you, Fred. Great to Thanks be with you, Dave. Us. Good to see you. Yeah. So for those that are not familiar with your work, can you give us just a quick background? How did you get to where you're at now, particularly the use of technical analysis? How did that sure. sort of come to be? Sure. Like a lot of people, I started out using fundamental analysis. Right. And I had one disaster in particular that made me realize that there had to be a better way of doing it. <laughs> Um, it's a common story. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's okay. one of the common yeah. stories. But mine was particularly funny, and I'll relate it to you. Please. Um, there was a stock called Moto Photo years <laughs> right. ago. Yeah, yeah. And my friend Dennis's father mm -hmm. called me up and said, I'm buying an area franchise <laughs> for Moto Photo. It's going to be really, really good. And I always listened to this man <laughs> because he started out basically as a sharecropper and ended up owning two banks and an oil company in Oklahoma, okay. friend from school. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, if he says it's gonna be good, that's good. So I said, well, you know, Ralph, is there anything you can tell me or give me some help to get some information on the company? He goes, right. yeah, there's this guy named John Hazelton. Okay. Um, he is the head of investor relations. You can call him anytime, he knows your name. So I call this guy up and he says, you know, um, and this, mind you, back, was back in the 80s when the rules on insider information were different. He right. said, you know, um, we just had the analysts from Prudential, from uh, Beige, Halsey, Stewart and Shields, yep. from Shearson in, um, and we told them we were gonna have some really good earnings. And these guys are going back to write their reports. <laughs> and I think you're gonna be very happy if you own the stock. And wow. sure enough, out come the reports, the earnings were great, and the stock goes up. Right. So I literally, this is like my first three, four weeks as a broker at Bear Band Securities, and I had found religion. This is okay. easy. <laughs> the police officer that gave me a ticket when I was driving into the office at you know, in the morning at six yep. o'clock in Culver City, California, I got him to buy Moto Photo. My grandmother <laughs> owned Moto Photo. Everybody owned Moto Photo, and the stock started going down. Right. And so I called up Mr. Hazelton. I said, hey, you know, John, what's with the stock going down here? He goes, we don't think, understand this at all. Um, we think we're gonna be reporting some more fabulous earnings and some new parts of the company, country are gonna open up and this is gonna be, just be great. And the stock kept going down. And to make a very long story that was quite painful <laughs> short, it took me two years to figure out what happened. Right. And what happened was, one hour photo developing became so cheap that everybody could buy a machine and start doing it. Yeah, yeah, you right. went in any shopping mall. Moto Photo actually was one of the very last companies <laughs> to kick the bucket. And interestingly <laughs> enough, you know, I worked for uh, Ian Notley at the Notley Information oh, right, Service sure, for a sure. while. Um, and his office in Toronto was right above a Moto Photo office. Perfect. <laughs> and this was in like God, 2000. I said, my yeah. God, they still have one of these? <laughs> and I went in and, but I owe that man because he gave me my career basically. So right. I started reading about technical analysis okay. and learning about indicators and yep. uh, ended up meeting a man named Larry Williams, who's been right. a friend and a, and a real mentor to me. Yep. And, basically wrote him out of the blue. I just wrote him a letter and said, Larry, I've been working on this trading index that you've been talking about. And I think I found out a couple of things. And I got this really nice letter back saying, 
wow, you've really come up with something here. You've got talent at this. You ought to stick with it. And so that's basically, you know, how I became a full-time technician. That's great. Um, I found that I was not a really good stockbroker. I didn't have okay. the sales aspect of being a stockbroker. Yeah. Um, but I also found that I was very good at working with stockbrokers. So I was one of the very last old style sell side technical analysts. I ran the Robinson Humphrey technical analysis department right near here sure. for 10 years. Um, unkindly quit in 99 and sold all my Citigroup stock and semi retired and then went to Merrill Lynch in 2004 and stayed right. there till 2009. Okay. Um, doing sell side technical analysis. Right. And the Fred report as a business is real interesting. It's kind of unique because our primary market is financial advisor teams. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of retail yep. stock investors. We yep. have teams that are generally three to 300 million to I think a billion. Mm -hmm. Um, some are two or three billion, but big advisors yeah. that use my service. But it's not really something for the average guy that's looking for stock picks. Right, right. Um, I have a newsletter level of the service that gives basic market commentary for those mm -hmm. people. It's inexpensive enough so that people would want to do it. And I've written for, um, God, what's that? The street.com for a while. Sure. But it's really not my my forte. My forte is working with large advisor teams. Got it. So um, when I was reading through your bio, I, I I think I caught we have a mutual friend and mentor in Jeff Weiss. Yes. Who I think you worked with at uh, where were that Dean Witter maybe or where Jeff was at Shearson. Oh yeah, that's right. And yeah, yeah. when I was at Dean Witter as a mm -hmm. stockbroker, I have the rather I would say unique distinction of being the only broker in the 97th percentile of production that stayed with the firm for three years. Right. Because what I did to support myself was I traded for my branch manager who was in the top 0.03% of production. Right. And I made Larry Phillips a lot of money. Larry and I are still <laughs> friends. And every time Bob Juneman, the regional director, who I hope sees this, yeah. come, came in to fire me. Right. Larry would say, no, he works with me. He stays. Okay. But the way I met Jeff was yeah. actually another funny Fred story. Yeah. Um, I, in 1984, I'd been doing technical analysis for a year. I was still in grad school at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And I was still, you know, trying to figure out what I was going to do for in my life. Mm -hmm. So... I said, I want to meet some of these technical analysts. So I was going to New York to see my mom. Okay. So I called up Bob Farrell's office and said, hi, this is Fred. I'm going to come see Bob Farrell. And they hung up on me. Fred was not <laughs> going to see Bob Farrell that day. Um, so I went through a couple more yeah. and finally realized that I had to change the old game plan. Yeah. So I called Jeff Weiss's office mm -hmm. and I got this wonderful girl named Louise Zeller. Okay which was one of his secretaries. And I said, Louise, I want to meet Jeff, but I don't work with EF Hutton, but this is what I am. And how about I bring you a nice lunch and some flowers? And, you, and she says, yeah, I'll get you in to see Jeff. You do that, I'll get you in to see Jeff. <laughs> so I got in to see Jeff that way in 1984. And Jeff, awesome. you know, and I had a great conversation. Yeah. And he said, basically, I'm going to look around and see if I can help you. So when Robinson Humphrey needed a technical analyst. Yeah. Um, Bob Robbins, my old boss and dear friend still, was doing all the technical analysis and all the fundamental market, you know, head of market strategy type stuff. And they decided right. they needed someone who knew technol technical analysis to help them. Yeah. Um, Jeff called me and said, you need to call this guy, Bob Robbins. And I came out here to Atlanta uh, and that's how I got my first big job. The there's, there's a great lesson in there, I think, for younger uh, people trying to get in the industry. The common thread with both of those stories, with Larry Williams and yeah. with Jeff Weiss, was you persistently, proactively kind of found a way to get in touch with them, which is actually yeah. pretty cool. You know, <laughs> great stories. I'm all in favor of technology, yeah. <laughs> but there's nothing like actually talking to people yeah. and being personable yes. to make the kind of impression you need to get in the door. It's true. And you know what? It's the other funny thing about it. Um, we both have the involvement with the MTA or the CMT Association, yeah. different eras. I think we, were, we didn't really overlap, but, but we both have had experience there. And it strikes me 
the experiences I had early on meeting people like Ralph Acampora yeah. and others, John Bollinger, John Murphy, who were so accessible and yeah. open and willing with their time was just a really special part of that. So uh, that's great. Mentors make yeah. a big difference early on. They, they really help. Yeah. I, I'll never forget. I met Ralph down here. Yep. This was back um, when Ralph and John Brooks were still good friends. Yeah, sure, sure. And Brooksy had him down here and we all went to dinner. John was someone who really, yeah. you know, got me going in the in the MTA, which that's is, now, I guess, the CMT Association. Yep, yep. That's really hard for me, by the way. I, I apologize <laughs> if I keep saying MTA. Me too. I know. Um, it's okay. But, um, but no, we've got a unique membership and yeah. a unique size of the association yeah. so that you can still take time. And of course, I've had younger technicians come to me and I, you know, you do just about anything you can do to help these guys. That's right. That's right. And I've had a couple of assistants um, that have moved on and done very, very well. That's great. In market analysis and uh, portfolio management. And that's yeah, yeah, a tremendous yeah. feeling of gratification. That's great. Um, so, Fred, I have to ask, uh, so I, you started in the industry in 1983, you said? Yeah. Okay. So you started an industry right when the Dow broke above 1,000. Pretty much, good at yeah. the time. Pretty yeah. much, right? It was right around that period. Yeah. So I have to ask, what was that experience like? I mean, you essentially came into the industry right, right when we were coming out of the 70s, which were relatively painful, I would yeah. imagine. And then all of a sudden, we're in the 80s to 90s, which ended up being just this incredible bull run. What was that like? Also, 87, you're in a crash. I mean, what did that feel like early on in your career? What well, were those formative experiences like for you? Let me tell you a couple things yeah. that, that'll probably make you laugh. The first one is, you know, one of the things I've learned about markets is how you feel while they're going on is not necessarily <laughs> a reflection of long-term reality. Okay. Um, in 1984, I went into my office at Bear Band Securities and everybody was popping bottles of champagne open and screaming <laughs> because the Dow had just crossed 1300 on its way to 1400. Right. And almost immediately <laughs> after that, the, the Dow turned around and started going down and went down from basically January to July. Right. And what was real interesting about that was the Dow went from basically 1380, I think, oh to 1050. Yep. Okay. So that was a 30% or so, a nice solid 25, 30% decline. Yeah, You're yeah. in there. Wow. Okay. Um, it's easy now to look at a chart and say, well, all it did was pull back and test the old breakout. <laughs> right. Let me tell you, it didn't feel <laughs> like all it did was come back and test the old breakout. Okay. Right. Yeah. You felt pretty darn awful while yes. that was going on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you my crash of 87 story. And okay. this is one I tell my advisor clients today. Sure. Because it really is, I think, instructive. Yep. I was trading for my manager, Larry Phillips, at Dean Witter in 1987. Mm -hmm. And right around one of my favorite days and times in history, which will never repeat again, for hundreds of years, yep. which was October 9th, 1987, at 6.54 in the morning. It was 10987654, okay? <laughs> I realized that the market was going to have trouble. <laughs> and I also realized that I hadn't had a vacation in two years. <laughs> now I'm living in Southern California, but I am basically although quite erudite and cultured, a yeah. Southern redneck at heart. <laughs> I like barbecue. I like hanging out without wearing shoes right. and usually no shirt. And I serve myself. So I decided I was going to take some vacation time. Okay. And uh, so I wrote a letter to our clients basically saying, I think the market is going to have problems in October. So I'm going to cut our position size enormously and I'm going to leave and I'm going to come back at the end of October and see what's what. So I sold everything but about six stocks, six blue chip dividend type paying stocks yeah, yeah. and left and went on vacation. Now, the first place I went on vacation, I left on October 17th <laughs> and I went to Chicago to visit the floor of the exchange. So I'm on the floor 
on October 19th, 1987, <laughs> with a man named Larry Schneider, who was the head of Dean Witter Futures. And still, if he's alive, I'm sure he's still a friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he was older then, so he's probably not. So I'm running around on the floor of the exchange for the crash. Wow. Right. Incredible yeah. experience. Yeah. And uh, when I got back to my office, a lot of the clients called in and said, you know, first of all, this guy, Fred, is really sharp. <laughs> but why didn't you sell everything? OK. Right. And the right. answer to that question was, I didn't think we were going to have the crash 87. I thought we were just going to have a bad market for a month or two. <laughs> I didn't think it was going to be the crash of 87. But what was really interesting mm. about that was of the stocks that I kept. Yeah. One stock went from about 55 to about 30 and then okay. opened at 109 and went to 119 right away. Right. RJ Reynolds. Right. The first big LBO. Yep. From KKR. Yeah. Yeah. Those two things made my year. That was a huge gain <laughs> on that stock. We bought that stock around 40. Wow. And we got rid of it at 119 because I didn't take all the junk Not bonds bad. and stuff. I had my clients sell the stock and off we went. Yeah. And what that taught me was if you're going to be an investor, you have to actually invest. Mm. Yep. Right. Yep. You can make all the trading decisions you want, but you have to actually invest. Right. Right. So that's my 1987 I love, story. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's really, really good. So. As you're thinking about, uh, you know, now running the Fred Report, uh, which has been very successful so far, what, how would you describe your approach to um, to technical analysis, your approach to the markets? In particular, what sort of routines, what do you do to consume all the information you need? You know, I have, I, first of all, I work almost all through the weekend. Okay, got um, it. Because I publish on Monday, Monday I publish yep. on Wednesday, and then for my conference call level people, I do a chart book on Wednesday night. Yep. and a conference call on Thursday morning. Okay. And then I do a sector report that comes out every two weeks and a monthly report that comes out monthly. Got it. I was trying really hard to come up with a name for the monthly report, and I finally decided on monthly report because I publish it monthly. <laughs> um, but it works. So I, I do a lot of, and, and a lot of my work is done in the evenings. When I was, even when I was at Merrill Lynch, right. I had my team prepare stuff for me to work on, and I'd come in uh, at seven or eight, and work through until one or two in the morning. Right, okay. Um, since I started my career in California, I take a nap every day after the market <laughs> closes, which in California was two o'clock. Yeah, I was gonna say right in the And afternoon. then I go surfing. Okay. I don't go surfing here, I play with my dogs, <laughs> right? Um, but I take that nap every day, and I find that that really helps me sort of adjust from working during the trading day. Yeah, good in transition terms, time. Yeah, right. exactly, because yeah. you can't sit there and trade and think about long-term philosophical things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yep. You're that's thinking right. more in terms of the long term philosophical, my money's disappearing. What do I do? <laughs> um, that's the extent of philosophy. In terms of the type of indicators I use, yep. I teach a combination of stochastics okay. and moving averages. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in simple technical indicators, especially for teaching my people yeah. what they can look for to get a hold of me. Right. I've tried some of the more esoteric things and have had friends like Walter Murphy and Bob Prechter that are real sure. experts at the Elliott Wave, yep. but I can't make it work for me. Yeah. Um, I would put my forecasting record up against almost anybody's um, and say I've done as well or better. And my portfolios that I run for the Fred Report, every single one of them has beaten their benchmark every year for seven years. So the Not portfolios bad. are good. Yeah. Um, the only thing I do that's a little bit different is all of my market analysis is done on ETFs. I Got don't okay. look at the major indexes. Sure. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, ETFs are actually traded, so they have volume and you can actually analyze them technically. Yeah. But perhaps more important, most of my client firms like Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley, their research analysts are not allowed to discuss ETFs, uh, individual right. ETFs. Perfect. So that gave me a niche to get into sure. originally. Sure, sure. And that's served me well. And I would imagine for your advisor clients, that's a pretty accessible way to access a lot of markets. Exactly. ETFs. Yeah. And because uh, yeah. again, when you're trying to deploy a couple hundred million dollars in two or three days, yeah. it's real hard to buy individual stocks. This is true. Yeah. So we're recording this sort of early February 2020. 
you know, stocks have been at all time highs for a stretch, pulling back with the news out of China yeah. and everything. You have bonds that have been just ripping to the upside. What are you telling people right now? What are you seeing overall here in the first quarter? Well, it's interesting. My fixed income portfolios have mm -hmm. outperformed without really owning bonds. I've been using a cocktail <laughs> approach um, okay. with very large yields, preferred stock ETFs like VRP. Oh, sure. Okay. Yields five and a half percent and yeah. is also at all time highs. Right, right. Um, I, don't, I think the big danger here is that the economy is stronger than people think and this move in bonds goes away. And in fact, for someone who wants to take some risk, not my advisor clients, but someone who wants to take some risk, yeah. if, TL, if uh, LQD, if yep. this breakout fails and it comes back in, yeah. this is the classic Larry Williams whoops trade. You can short LQD for a move all the way back down. Yeah, that's right. So I'm, I'm going to play that one. Yep. Um, uh, I am. I figured the market would correct in February, March. I put that in my yearly forecast. Yeah. Um, we seem to be seeing the kind of the technical indicators to me. The internals look much better. Yeah. So it may not be a, enough of a correction for people to short. So we're buying it. We think the market's going to be strong into the election, basically. Interesting. Going into the into the fall, right? Yeah. Where yeah. I differ with most of my client firms is mm -hmm. they're all talking about how international is going to do better than U.S. this year. Mm. And I don't think so. I think international can do well. I think emerging markets can do well. Sure. I'm using a broad-based ETF, PXH, which okay, is... Right an ETF that's fundamentally weighted in deep value for emerging markets. The last yeah. time EEM was up 20%, this was up 34%. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, so there's all sorts of stuff like that you can do with smart beta. And by the way, smart beta was invented by technicians, <laughs> not an ETF company. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in the U.S. markets, at least until Interesting. The U.S. over international. Yeah. Yeah. Where, if someone's just getting started, just as a, as a final question, what would you suggest they do to learn more about how you're approaching things? What should they read? What should they be looking at, do you think? Well, there's a couple things you can do. Yeah. Um, the first one is get a trial subscription to the Fred Report <laughs> and contact me, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Yeah. But there's one book I always recommend. It's sure. an older book. Um, but the book Stock Market Logic by Norman Foster oh, yeah, right. is book, yeah. one of the best books on indicators as well mm. as easiest books to read. That book got me started. And of course, I ended up meeting Norman Foss back because I was That's interested great. in the book. Yeah. But the way that does one indicator per chapter and tells you what the indicator is, yeah. what he thinks of the indicator and how people use it, to me, is an invaluable survey course for technical indicators. That's fantastic. It's a lesser known book, but it's a really good one. It's on yeah. my bookshelf. And yeah, most good. people don't read it. I've got advisors buying it off Amazon. Yeah. All, you know, we <laughs> you are single handedly yeah. boosting yeah. the sales. But company. that book really got me started. Yeah. Um, and because I'm I'm a scientific artist. I agree with Steve Jobs in that respect. I like that. Yeah. Um, but there was enough science in stock mm. market logic behind these indicators. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that book taught me was, you know, if you're trying to measure a certain phenomenon, yeah. it helps to use an indicator that measures and works with that phenomenon, <laughs> right? And a lot of people don't. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You know, sentiment indicators, as you and I know, are condition indicators. Yep. I can't tell you how many times someone has said, my God, the put call ratio is really low. The market's going to turn around tomorrow. Right. And that's not what happens. That's not the idea. Sorry, but it yeah, doesn't yeah, yeah, happen. Yeah. And then right. they get all upset at the put call indicator <laughs> instead of themselves. So um, any other questions for me? No, that was great. Fred, thank you so, Good so much. This you. is a pleasure. Okay. We're here with uh, Fred Meisner, founder of the Fred Report here on location in Atlanta, Georgia.